Bishop McKee, and so he doesn't need to be introduced, but uh, I would like to present him to you at this point and to offer greetings. Hey, good, good afternoon. Thank you all of you for joining the call. The first thing I want to do is say to all of you that um, clergy and laity alike, how deeply I appreciate, I've written by the, about uh, my gratitude on a number of occasions, but again, how deeply I appreciate uh, the work that you're doing. Uh, as I've talked to clergy around the conference and as I've surfed, surfed through worship services on Sunday morning, I can't be any more proud of you and your congregations than I am, and I want you to know that. I know that this has been most challenging, uh, and I know that we probably have learned more about technology or about how to craft worship services online than we ever thought we would need to know. Or I, I gotta tell you, we're in a time that I never could imagine that we would be in. So I wanna thank you for the way in which you've done that. And to our laity who've been supportive and faithful as well and understanding about uh, this difficult, challenging time, I wanna thank you as well. Our, our, I know that we're gonna talk about how we relaunch and reopen churches um, and we're gonna be doing it in phases. And I've sort of made a, a blanket statement uh, that the East and the Northwest district uh, churches can begin to reopen. I do wanna say it's provided that all the guidelines are met. And we're also dependent, I think, on each one of our clergy and lay teams to really determine if that's feasible at this time, given, given the numbers in your county. I do want to say to you that those numbers continually change. And um, uh, so to lay it on the call, uh, we're giving your pastors authority to decide when and if the date actually happens. And I do want you to know that. And I think what we want, the reason I say that is because um, our, my great concern is, is that none of our churches become what I would call and other people have called a Petri dish for COVID-19 in your communities. And that is, is that people go to church one Sunday morning as that happened around this country in a lot of ways who believe that it couldn't happen. And all of a sudden, you know, there are 20 cases of COVID-19, which means the spread can happen quickly. So I, I know that uh, there's some people who deny uh, the severity of this virus or maybe even the numbers at times, they are very real. They are real. And uh, I think none of us want to uh, either um, uh, pass on the virus unwittingly, and none of us want to blatantly do it, but we want to ensure that everybody's as safe as they can be. And, uh, and so that, that's our work as churches. And I know, what, uh, I know that this has become a political football for some people. The, what, this is what it is, I think, for the North Texas Conference. It is our overwhelming desire and calling to do that which God calls us to do to share the gospel. And in so doing, to harm no one. And while there is no insurance policy for that, there is good judgment for that. And there is faithful people to do that. And if, if you get, you know, if you get into a place with a lay person or somebody else in the congregation, the community, and it, it gets to be challenging for you, we do want to know that. And it especially it happens within your congregation. I do want to know that. And I do want to know that because, you know, there are times I may just call someone up and say, hey, let's sort of talk this down off the ledge. No one should be at severe risk because of this. So anyway, I want to welcome you and thank you again. And I want to say a special word of appreciation. I've not done this out loud in a public group or even written wise to our district superintendents and uh, members of the point of cabinet. I want to thank, uh, thank them for the work they've done and that they continue to do to, uh, to continue to stay engaged with clergy and with laity and uh, the work they do in terms of helping learn new things and to provide some content about our work together. I also want to thank uh, members of the uh, Connectional Leadership uh, Office uh, for their work uh, as well. So uh, I want to thank you very much about that. Um, do we have somebody sharing screens? Who's Duncan Graham? <laughs> Mariel, can you help with that? I can't see anything. Okay, there we are. Anyway, so welcome and thank you for being here and for the work you do. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna uh, um, allow uh, the folks, our leadership, to uh, 
walk us through this and to be helpful and they they can answer a lot of questions and provide a lot of information and uh, I want to tell you this is not something at which this is a this is an environment that changes daily I mean we never would have thought three weeks ago that we'd be talking about the danger of singing um, but this has become a very real apparent fact uh, from a difference from studies and when you got and when you have the musicians who are saying let's don't sing that we you know then it's a challenge uh, that we need we need to reckon with in some way so god bless you and god bless your ministry and thank you again for what you do i uh, appreciate it very much uh i'm going to get on another zoom call uh related to something else and uh that i already had scheduled and i was unable to be with you the whole time anyway and but uh i know you're in very very good hands so cammy it's to you god bless all of you bye bye thank you so appreciate you all being on this call and I just want to go over what our plan is for the day so that you can our time together so you can know what to look forward to um, we are going to be spending some time um, discussing our pastoral leadership and what it means to be a, a, a pastoral uh, leader um, and that is both for the clergy and lay people who uh, lead the churches so I'm in, gonna invite you to um, just consider um, what, what biblical or scriptural um, direction uh, leads you in the work you do in faith. So um, I, I want to, you guys to think about that. Secondly, we're gonna be identifying um, the contextual challenges and realities that, the, uh, that we are all facing and um, what that looks like in your own communities and how it is that you will be responding to um, the, uh, the needs in your communities. Um, thirdly, I'd like us to step through a template that we have um, uh, taken from somebody else's good work and that's Jeff Powell's good work. Um, and, uh, and I just wanna go back to say, we did invite persons who are in the small to medium sized churches to be on this call today. Uh, if your church is large, you can put it into a context, but our focus today is gonna be on the small and medium sized church. And he's done a great job in Archer City in uh, thinking through how to um, you know, go through the, and make a plan for his church. Um, then I'm gonna also show you all the, the state regulations and the guidelines just so you know where to find them or you can download them so you can have them at, at your ready. And then we're going to um, put you all in groups to be able to have conversations uh, with group leaders that are your, either your DS or center directors in order to engage in a fuller conversation so that you can have shared wisdom and go through the process of um, what it looks like to, uh, when you get to a point of, of reopening, um, to, to make a plan ahead of time. So that's the, the, the part that's gonna be um, most of your time. And then lastly, we're, I've invited our uh, leaders, our district superintendents and our center directors to uh, pray for you and for you to pray for one another so that we can, as we walk together in faith, uh, continue to be those who um, uphold one another and spiritually. So um, that's my, uh, our plan for today. And um, I just want to continue to um, um, thank you for your presence here and, and uh, end our time. So um, let me begin by setting the table a little bit with um, some theology uh, and give you a little background. When, uh, when all of the residents, the, the pastors who come through our conference um, enter into a residency program, we ask them to do integration work. We ask them to take their theology and put it into their practice of ministry. And so one of the things I wanna share with you today is you think about who you are as the people of God um, that are leading the church. Um, you know, we are different than than say opening up an office building. We are, um, we are not managers particularly of, of uh, facilities, although that's part of our purview. Um, our call as Christians is to lead theologically. 
And so I started to think about what that might look like in today's context. And um, I was thinking about the fact that when I was um, asked originally a few years ago to uh, be a district superintendent, in the middle of the night, I had this dream and it woke me up. And it was a dream of God saying to me, ground yourself in me and partner with me and help me create a healthier body of Christ. And I, I, I had a long conversation in my journal with God, what does it mean to be a healthier body of Christ? What does it mean to, to live in ways that, um, you know, I guess acknowledge and uh, other people's giftedness. And, and so, um, so I, I started living that out. And as I did, I started thinking about the fact that um, everything that um, God was asking me to do was really um, empowering others and also thinking about what gifts I bring. Um, so as, as I think about the situation that we're in right now and what it means to be a healthy body of Christ, we really are those who are asked to um, look at, at the present circumstances and place um, uh, our vision of what God has asked us to, to do. So for, for me, it's um, thinking of all of the ways that God is, uh, the body of Christ is living itself out. Some, some folks are um, in sheltered places because they need to, to uh, their giftedness um, needs to be in, all of us are in sheltered places, but we're using our giftedness in different ways. Um, so some are delivering food, others are receiving it and, um, and encouraging one another through phones. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of things that are going on. We can translate that to how we move back into our buildings as well and recognize that there'll be parts of our body that will be uh, in our buildings and there'll be parts of our body that are not going to be in our buildings. They can't be. Um, but that doesn't mean that their giftedness is not utilized. So I just want to lay that framework of how I'm thinking about the church and how the church is being the church. Um, and I could take that to the next degree of, of how we look at the facilities um, and using everybody's giftedness and abilities as they um, you know, look at the, at the use of the buildings in different ways. Um, and I'm just going to stop there because I wanted to just take a minute to give Todd Harris an opportunity to unmute and to talk about his theological point of view um, uh, as he thinks about being um, it, it in a different way. Go ahead, Todd. So, Cammie, thank you for... Um for leading us in, in this uh, exercise, because I think as uh, local church pastors and as local church members, as followers of Jesus Christ, um, we look to scripture to guide us and we look to our theological reference references to, to guide us in making decisions in all seasons of life. So Cammie, thank you for, um, for engaging us in uh, this important work, engaging us theologically, uh, because hopefully, hopefully we all think differently I've long uh, resonated with uh, the image of God as shepherd. The 23rd Psalm is, is, a, is a Psalm that always speaks to my heart and that uh, different verses have spoken into different seasons of my life. And, um, and so I've long resonated with the image of God as shepherd. And then for years and years and years, uh, and even to this day, I, I've uh, resonated with the image of shepherd as in pastoring a church uh, for nearly 30 years, I, I saw myself as a, as a shepherd in the midst of that. And, um, and even now as a district superintendent, I continue to understand my ministry as, as a shepherd. And, uh, and as, I think, uh, as I think about that, um, I certainly am not the, the, the lead shepherd. And uh, I see Christ as, uh, as the great shepherd. And uh, Christ is the head of the church and is the shepherd of the church, and that Christ is the one who leads us and guides us in, in all that we do. And, and I think as, as pastors, or at least as I understand uh, my role, I think Christ invites me into that role of, of shepherding people uh, as Christ shepherds me. 
but anyway, so I, I, I find myself thinking in terms of um, shepherding in uh, the district that, uh, that, that there's so many ways you can, you can talk about uh, a DS as a shepherd. And that part of my role is, is to guide the sheep and uh, the sheep include both clergy and laity. And I have had uh, many conversations with, with laity in this season, but primarily my conversations have been um, with pastors in, in terms of how do we guide our congregations in this. So I, I see my role as a shepherd. And, and not only do I engage them in how they lead their sheep, but also uh, hopefully guiding us as a, as a district uh, into green pastures and besides still waters and to experience uh, all the ways in which God refreshes our souls. Um, and, and so I understand my, my role as, as the shepherd. Now, sometimes the shepherd is out in front of the sheep um, and, and calling them. Um, when I used to have cows when I was in high school, I'd go out into the pasture and I'd call the cows, but they'd come to my truck and eat and uh, off the back of my truck. And so there are times when I call the sheep as a district superintendent, and, uh, and I do that through a variety of ways, and I've come to do that through Zoom is one of the ways, and, uh, and hopefully offering times to um, engage with one another and to eat and to be refreshed, uh, at least uh, spiritually. And then there are times I'm in the middle of the, of the flock, and, um, and, and sometimes when I'm in the middle of the flock or the herd of sheep, it's like ultimate chaos. Uh, but, but I find that even in the chaos, God is guiding us in, in a mutual direction for the most part. And then there are times I'm at the end of the herd and I'm moving the sheep forward in, in terms of where we go. And I felt that way in a, in a local church as, as the shepherd and, and seeing myself in all those different places. Um, thank, thank God for uh, sheep dogs that come along uh, the way to help us in, in herding the sheep um, because uh, we can't do it by ourselves. And so there are those that, that come along uh, with us and, and are partners with us in, in that image. And, um, and, and so as I live that out in the role of district superintendent in this, um, in this crazy Corona time, um, I've already mentioned some of the ways that I've, I've tried to shepherd in my district, but, uh, but I have to ask myself, what would the shepherd of, of a church do? As we think about um, not, not only how we've been doing ministry and looking for new ways of doing ministry, but as I think specifically about how do I, re how, how would I return or invite people to return to the building? What would I as shepherd do? And as shepherd, I see myself as having a responsibility uh, to make sure the sheep are safe, uh, to make sure the, the, the sheep are, um, are uh, aware of the guidelines of how we gather safely. As, as shepherd of the flock, I uh, make sure that, that people know the parameters of, uh, of how we uh, gather in sacred space. And, and all of this is applicable to the district as well. Um, I, I see my role as, as lifting up um, the rules and regulations that are provided by our conference and by uh, the, the state of Texas and by uh, county guidelines. And, and so making sure that people are aware of those. The other thing as a shepherd that I do in terms of helping people to get safe, uh, to be safe, is, is to make them aware that we're, we're bigger than, than just one person. That, that we as, as a sheep who are part of, of God's flock have a responsibility for our neighbor. Sometimes sheep have a tendency only to think of themselves and not of anyone else. And so as the shepherd, I need to remind the sheep they are part of something much larger and what they realize and we each have a responsibility one to the other to make sure the other is safe and and so there are things that that i do that um, hopefully will model that as i think about inviting the sheep back to the building i do i think about what's my example in all of this so like wearing a mask um, i know there's a lot of debate about whether or not uh, we should wear masks but I, should, I believe I should model that, that right behavior. I believe I should model uh, not uh, hugging people or shaking hands as much as I want to, as much as I need that. I feel like as the shepherd, I've got to model that. So anyway, um, you know, as I, as I think theologically about um, this season, as I think theologically about uh, my role as a leader in the church, it, it is uh, the image of the good shepherd that uh, I resonate with. And, uh, and it is the good shepherd that uh, guides us all, that knows us all by name, and is continuously in, at work in our lives, uh, calling us to be a part 
of uh, the herd of the flock. So Thank anyway, you. I could go on and on. But. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Um, so today, what we'd love, I appreciate what you've offered, Todd, and that's why I asked you to speak. Um, I, I think today, as we engage in this conversation, I want us to just begin thinking of ourselves as spiritual leaders and how, how will we employ uh, biblical, scriptural, um, theological imagery that leads us. And so um, in a, uh, probably a, about 10 minutes, you're going to be uh, asked the question in your small groups, um, what guiding biblical image best describes your view as you make plans to reopen your building for ministry use? And I'd love for you to just consider that as uh, you are thinking of who you are as the faithful leader. And I will, um, I think we can get that in the chat, that question. And, um, and then we'll also be asking you the question with this image in mind, what is the message you, and that you're going to communicate and say to your congregation? So just keep that in mind as um, we move to the, ne the next thing and, and you'll have some time to think about it. Um, the next thing I, I would like to do is uh, invite Kay Eck to, to say a couple words. Now Kay is not from a, a medium uh, or small church, um, but she is a, uh, from Lover's Lane United Methodist Church. She is a great resource and um, she, their, their church is divided into smaller congregations that all meet within the church. And they recently had a survey. Um, and one of the things that I'm lifting up for you all uh, today is that um, I want you to keep in mind your context. They um, took their context and they decided to do a questionnaire survey to find out how their people um, are feeling right now and, and, and their responses to the church. So. Okay, if you just come up and um, offer your insights from that, appreciate it. Thanks for being with us today, sure. Reverend Kay Eck. Hi friends, my name is Kay. I'm so happy to see some familiar faces and it's great to be with you this morning, or I guess it's this afternoon now. Um, when Cammie called, I said, Cammie, I'm not an expert in this subject at all, um, but we do have a great staff team at Lover's Lane that's really been thinking about the best way to approach this. And I would say that we've made a shift from whole, the whole like, let's get back to normal as soon as we can to asking questions like, what does the new normal look like and how do we adapt to continue to meet the needs of our congregation? Um, if you don't know or follow Carrie Newhoff, I strongly suggest that you do. I'm going to drop his um, website in the comments in just a minute. He's a pastor of a large church called Connexus in Canada and teaches on leadership. And he actually has a free leadership course at seven uh, I think seven sessions that's totally free that you can do online that's, that is definitely worth your time. I follow him and um, he is one of the most influential people when it comes to my growth, but he said this recently in a blog, he said, reopening your church is so much more complex than closing it ever was. Reopening your church is so much more complex than closing it ever was. And I think we find that to be true, right? Um, so like Cami said, we have at Lover's Lane, it, it's a unique church because we have seven worship services on a Sunday morning. So that makes those individual congregations small to medium size. And so that really is affecting how we're thinking through this. The first thing that we did is sent a survey to our congregation, which I'd be happy to share with you, asking questions like, have you attended worship online? How have you experienced God online? Have you participated in any online group or class? Are you in what the C, um, C, CDC considers a high risk category? Would you bring someone, if we were to open, would you bring someone to worship with you who is in the high risk category? Would you bring your children if we were to open? Would you be interested in participating in a home church? And so we started analyzing some Results and they really were about what I expected. Um, 
but I was pleasantly surprised that over two thirds of the people who took the survey reported that they have experienced God more or the same as they have in person. So I thought that was really encouraging. We had about half of the respondents say that they have participated in an online group or class. And many of the comments actually said, once we do reopen, can we continue doing these groups and classes online so I don't have to get out, get out of my house and drive to the church? They're really enjoying that. About 60% of the responders are in what the CDC calls the high risk category. 75% of people said that they were unlikely to come back or it depends on the safety precautions in place when asked if they would come back if we reopen. That 75% said eh. And 92% said they would not bring um, a person in a high risk category or that it depends on the safety precautions in place. So I think just to Todd's point about shepherding, that's told us a lot about where, where our people are and what they are ready for. So just a couple of things that we're doing at Lover's Lane. I'm sure you've already thought through some things, but this has been helpful conversation for us. Right now, our staff on campus, we only have the administrative staff on campus. And anybody who comes in has to sign in. We enter through one door that's propped open so people aren't pushing on the handles. And then you have to wear a mask and maintain social distance barriers. We do have volunteers on campus who um, are working with our food ministry. We're distributing food, but they also have to sign in, sanitize, wear masks and gloves. And then any staff on campus, if, if you need to go on campus for a certain reason, you have to sign in so we know who's there. And that way we know more about where all to clean, what offices to clean. Um, but And you have to leave campus by five, wear a mask. So for worship, we've been thinking about ways um, what it would look like if people do start to come back. Um, and those things are just making sure that we are cleaning each space after a worship service, requiring people to wear masks um, and providing one if you don't have one. And also thinking through questions like, if you ask people to come and wear a mask and you give them one and they don't wear it, what do you do? What, you know, do you throw them out? <laughs> you know, it's just, we're thinking through those sorts of questions. We, have, well, we will have hand sanitizer at all entrances to the campus and of course continue to keep doors propped open. And we're talking about moving as many services as we can to our largest venue, which is our sanctuary, just so that we can be spaced out even more. We have decided that we'll do no kids programming until school starts, um, that we'll ask people to enter and exit through different doors as we can. Um, we'll remove the offering basket and put one in the back, um, you know, not past the plate. We removed our registration pads. We've removed Bibles and hymnals and pens from the pews, those things that we touch. We'll eliminate bulletins and that sort of thing. Um, of course, we've already talked about no congregational singing, but we'll utilize pre-recorded small ensembles instead. And then we have, we've said we won't have any kids programming this summer on Sunday mornings including VBS and our summer camps that we have planned. And the same thing with our youth ministry. Um, we, we won't do camps or mission trips this summer, but we are trying to figure out, can we gather small groups of youth in backyards and then live stream? I think our kids are using Instagram Live. Can we Instagram Live that small group or worship time from different places around the city? But with all of that said, we've been talking about how do we switch our thinking to address this new normal and, and not just trying to go back to the way that things were. So we think we'll see a move toward online. So we want to keep planning worship with that in mind. I think if we were just to open the doors of the church and say, hey, come on back, that we'll see a small percentage of people who actually are ready to come back. And so we want to continue focusing on a great online worship experience. Um, so what is it like to create worship where we continue to address our online viewers as well as the people in the room? I think I've, I've heard it said like, um, before COVID happened, many of us were doing Facebook Live or we were um, live streaming and we let the online viewer look over our shoulder into what was happening in the room. And since COVID, we have started streaming online and we, as people come back, 
can we let them look over our shoulder into our live broadcast and continue to focus on um, meeting the needs of the people who are online. So one resource I wanna share with you that might be helpful if you are trying to use Facebook Live, if you don't have a, you know, a tech team, you can set up Facebook Live um, and hit record, but there's a resource that's also free. It's called StreamYard, and it allows you to put words and pictures on the screen, you know, like on the lower thirds. Um, so for those of you who might not have access to ProPresenter, other things like that, you can set up your whole um, worship service and anything you want on the screen from, um, you know, scripture or hymn lyrics or whatever it is. And then you can run that as you are doing your worship service. So that's free and it's called StreamYard. So as we're planning, we're considering the quality of the worship experience too. And we're, we're not um, quick to say we need to reopen for the same reason that the bishop said that we believe it's our call to do no harm. But we want to consider the quality of the experience, not only for the online viewer, but also for those who do come back once our campus starts to open. Um, there's a, a pastor named Larry Osborne at North, Co North Coast Church in California who has a video, and I'll share this link with you as well, but it really helps you ask the questions around quality of worship, children, and then um, your worship and music experience. So will early services once you start to allow people back in will it be a quality experience and at lovers lane we're, we're talking about is it going to be okay to come in and not be able to greet anyone to wear a mask and to not sing or can people experience god online more than um, they might in worship he also asked questions like if we don't open our children and youth program and we ask our kids to come to church and sit with their families and then, then they don't have a great experience, a quality of worship service because we're singing like this or, you know, whatever, then what does that teach them about God? I think that's a great theological question. And then what's the experience of the congregation without singing? So I'll share that video with you. It's only about 10 minutes and it's worth it um, to take a watch. So all yeah. that is to say, we're being very cautious at Lover's Lane. We don't have an open date in mind, um, but we are really relying on the bishop's recommendation. And it is really helpful. It has been really helpful for me to be able to say, oh, I'm sorry, the bishop won't let us open yet. Um, I've even sent a text to the DS and said, I need you to say no to this request. Um, can we blah, blah, blah. And Deborah responded with a no, and that's just having our back is really helpful as well. Thank you, Kay. Okay, Kimmy, I all think that's all I have. <laughs> um, I think there were a couple of folks that wanted to know about the possibility of seeing an example of your uh, survey. So that's on the chat. And if that's possible, that could be a resource uh, for people just to have good questions. So Absolutely. great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move to uh, back to Todd, and uh, he has an example of a plan that was made, as I talked about it earlier before, um, that's from the Archer City Church. No, that's not right. The Iowa Park Church. A park. And, yeah. They're, they are connected because they're, they're, their pastures are married. They're married. So. Yeah. Right. So I... Um, I just want, I also want to say that I really appreciate um, the work that all of our pastors are doing uh, with the guidelines. And uh, I know in my district, I've heard from many of you, and uh, some of you I still owe an email to, and I will get to that later today. But uh, you, you've shown me your plans uh, for reopening and uh, the guidelines that you're following. So I appreciate the work that all of you are doing. Um, Jeffrey Pell is one of those who emailed me and said, here are the guidelines. What do you think about them? And, uh, and so it, his uh, sort of systemic thinking um, helps me uh, when he puts it in a chart and, and I know right where he's going and it has a checklist. So am I, do I need to put that up or are y'all going to put that up? So, um, so anyway, this is, and, and we're gonna have time with this in the small groups, but this is um, a checklist and a guide that, that Jeff put together and um, and, and that he's using within his church. And um, a couple of things that, uh, that I really find helpful about that 
would be um, he has guiding principles that could be a theological reference for why we're doing what we're doing. And, uh, and he is uh, putting everything under this idea of doing, doing no harm, which we as United Methodists know is very much a part of, part of our uh, DNA and who we are and how we lead and how we interact with other people. And so especially in this time of um, COVID-19 and uh, sheltering in place and thinking about reopening, I think at the heart of what we're doing really is thinking about doing no harm to other people or putting people at risk. So the other thing too that I appreciate about uh, sort of his guiding principles, he has a purpose statement there. And, um, and, and so the purpose of this document is to sort of detail their procedures and, uh, and will be a guiding force for them for now and into the future and they'll be able to amend it for the future. And so I know he's working specifically with his leaders and uh, we've all been encouraged to work with leaders, not to be an island out there on our own, not to be the solo shepherd, um, but to really uh, think about working collaboratively with our leaders, but guiding them in this process. So I um, appreciate Jeff's thinking about how do we minimize in-person in activities and maximize their experience. Uh, Kay talked about that. And then, um, and then providing alternatives. Uh, for people to meet. I do know that there's some places in the Northwest District because we're more outdoors that there are some churches that have provided some small group gatherings outside and uh, people are spacing their chairs out underneath trees and, um, and enjoying the outdoors, but they're, they're doing it um, with parameters and, and how people are to gather in those. So, but providing alternatives, I like what Jeff says here, for those who do not wish or are unable to attend in-person worship services and participate in the worship rituals, uh, alternative options will be made uh, 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 will be made for you, be made available to you. And so you can see that for yourself. But they're thinking about all the people uh, in the community of faith, not just those who want to come and gather for worship. So then, if we scroll up a little bit, um, you can begin to see uh, more of the framework uh, for this template. And um, when we meet in our small groups, you'll see how, um, um, how the folks at, at Iowa Park have filled in uh, their, their response in the middle column. But you see the description of all the things that they're thinking about. And you see how detailed they get from uh, the number of worship services that they're going to offer, to social distancing, uh, to movement of people, uh, how the greeters will function, what the doors would look like, uh, down to singing music. A lot has been said about um, uh, congregational singing and, and, uh, and there's stuff that's coming out from musicians now that, that talk about the dangers of, of congregational singing. Uh, and not just congregational singing, but the sharing of liturgy, the recitation of, of liturgy in the church um, and how that uh, can, can, can share germs with other people. So let's keep scrolling down and you'll continue to see the details that um, Jeff goes into. So it covers childcare, Sunday school, um, how they're gonna clean their worship spaces, their ongoing uh, ministries. So he's got a detailed guide. And then communication. Uh, communication is a huge part. I've shared with the, the pastors and in, in the district here that we cannot over communicate our plan. And uh, we know this day and time, people get their information from all kinds of sources. And so I really appreciate how uh, Jeff has thought about the communication plan and how he's going to share the information. Uh, and he's gone into great detail from everything from the pulpit uh, to the church sign out front and, and to word of mouth, helping people to sort of script the narrative uh, about uh, how the, the church is taking uh, precautions. So, so anyway, this is a template and, uh, and this template will be made available to you. And like I said, um, uh, when we get into our small groups, you'll see the detailed uh, plan that, uh, that Iowa Park is using. And then you even see how the, the document um, even put a place for me to sign on there. So, um, so you see how this document is, is fleshed out and how it can be utilized. And then, and then in the, the, uh, the columns to the right, uh, there's spaces there for you to check off, put a date in, um, ongoing kinds of things. So really all of this is ongoing, but, but anyway, but there's a great template and, and I appreciate the work that Jeff is doing, but I also appreciate the work that all the pastors are doing to adhere to the guidelines laid out by the by the North Texas Conference and by the state of Texas. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to Jeff Pell for his leadership. Um, I want us, us to see two documents, then I'm going to invite us to go into breakout rooms. 
um, and have about 45 minutes of conversation. Um, so uh, what I'd like to have up is a checklist for churches and houses of worship. Um, this is the, the document that we um, put out with, uh, with the bishop's letter last week. And so just wanted to just remind you that, that this is the uh, Health and Human Services has sent this to us. Um, and this is, uh, we are to follow the regulations. So please follow um, what this document says. It's part of um, um, what we walk with with the law. And then also, um, I guess, no, I want you guys, there's three pages of it. So go ahead and scroll down just so you guys know what's on here. There we go. And you can just follow all the things that they are saying for places of worship. You can keep on scrolling. And that is on our website and it'll also be um, on the chat and you can download that. Um, and the second is uh, something that we've put together that's a little bit more for our local use as we think about who we are as a church. And these are just the guidelines for returning to your local church sites. And um, I want you guys to note that when we talked about pulling this all together, that as a cabinet, we, we realized that so that you as a church, your lay pe the lay people, the pastors, all have agency to be able to think through um, all the, you know, all the different ways to uh, look through the worship setting and look at the, the, the ways the building is used. Um, and, but we just wanted to be able to prompt you with questions for you to, con to go through and, and consider how you're going to respond given your context. Um, when we stand at, at the more of a balcony perspective, we have so many different contexts that we are looking at. And we know that you know your context best, and we, we trust. Um, we, we also talked about in the cabinet that we will have your back. So just uh, make sure you ask us for assistance along the way, and um, we're certainly welcome. Uh, we'll welcome your phone calls and um, to walk alongside you as you make these um, decisions. So those are the two pieces that are, are, um, we've offered for you to, to um, utilize and we we uh, will also have those in the chat sections um so uh, at this point um if mariel is ready are you ready mariel with I'm ready. okay she has now put she, uh, she she and kelly need to be commended because they have coordinated 152 people <laughs> into breakout sections sessions and if you've not ever done this before, um, when they ask for you to join a breakout session, um, just uh, click onto it and that'll put you with a, uh, what I thought was gonna be a small group, but it's gonna be a larger small group of um, you with a district superintendent or um, one of the center directors. And we'll go ahead and have our own conversations about how we engage this. So thanks so much. See you all soon. you once again for uh, your participation today. If you look in the chat room um, on the very low bottom of your screen, if you haven't done this before, you can go to chat. Uh, you can see there that there's uh, all the documents. There's the uh, North Texas uh, Church Places of Worship document. There's um, Andy's also putting in um, a list of recommendations from the Texas Department of, of Health and Human Services. Um, there should be, um, uh, there's several other items on there from Lover's Lane United Methodist Church and things that she has done, as well as um, it looks like some work from Mike Bonham, who is a church consultant for all of you guys to be able to use the uh, resources that we've got here. There's also where if you go on the website, you'll also see um, 
places where you can use, utilize resources we've been putting up for the whole churches. And uh, thank you for the time you've spent today uh, here. Um, thanks to the district superintendents for leading the groups and the center directors, I appreciate that. Um, Kelly Carpenter, who's been helping with the chat and adding information to uh, your resource and uh, particularly Mariel uh, Veda, who spent some time trying to uh, sort you all into to rooms. So I appreciate uh, the gifts that they brought today. Um, before we go, I have been asked to share that uh, last announcement that there's going to be a lunchtime trivia. If anybody wants to just do something for fun and not just um, work, work, work on Zoom, you can join uh, yet another Zoom opportunity <laughs> um, for uh, uh, that's hosted by uh, Owens Center. And oh, according to him, there's prizes. So there you go. You'll have fun with that. You want to say anything more about that, Owen? Just the grand prize is Bishop McKee will uh, record his voice on your answering machine. So if that doesn't bring everybody to the game, then I don't know what will. So I guess I'll hope, be there. <laughs> hope to see some of you <laughs> Thursday at high noon. Yeah. Um, also, we are here for you all. Um, our the center directors would like to support you in your work. So please don't hesitate to contact us through email and. Um, and if you want a phone call, just have a chat, leave your phone number, we'll call you and uh, help you along the way. Um, thanks for the, the way that you are faithful and uh, you're leading our churches. Um, thank you to the lay people who are part of leading today as well and the, and the clergy. So go with this uh, benediction. Uh, you are the people of God sent by God, uh, created by God, and empowered by God. We pray your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's presence be in all of you as you walk in faith, as you journey this life in these few next coming days. In the name of Christ. Amen. Blessings to you all.